Hi, welcome to Conversations with a Wounded Healer. I'm your host, Sarah Bueno, and this is a podcast where we talk about healing and all of the many different facets that it includes. And today's guest is going to tell you how she plans to use a car wash for healing. So stay tuned for that. <laughs> Before we get to my guest today, though, I would love if you are a listener of this podcast and you like what you hear, if you could go to Apple podcast and rate and review, it would help us. Oh, so, 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 so much. It actually helps us put the podcast in front of more people. So that would be fantastic. And offer still stands. If you say something that makes me laugh, I will read it on the air. And then you'll be like super famous. OMG. Okay. Anyway, let me tell you about today's guest. Today's guest is Kim Young. She's a licensed clinical social worker in the Commonwealth of Virginia with over a decade of experience working alongside youth, families, and communities. Kim is deeply committed to cross-sector collaboration that utilizes an asset-based approach to develop strategies which promote community-driven solutions to system-created problems. Kim is just so delightful. And you can find her at dope black underscore social worker on Instagram. We're going to give you all the goodies about her. And she's also got a couple upcoming webinars. So make sure that you are checking the show notes. But until then, please enjoy my conversation with the lovely Kim Young. Hello, Kim. Welcome to Conversations with a Wounded Healer. How are you? I am well. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited for the conversation. You are. Well, I'm excited that you're excited. <laughs> <laughs> So you're one of the many folks. Instagram is like my best place for podcast guests. I don't know. Instagram has brought so many amazing people to this podcast and into my life. So you are are now one of those people. I found you under Dope Black Social Worker, right? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Well, tell us more about who you are and what you do. So I get this question a lot, but I'm imagining you get it too, just as the nature of the mm -hmm. work. And it is a difficult question to answer because if we answer it honestly, people are going to think something wrong with us. Like when they really <laughs> ask, like, what do you do? They're going to be like, oh. Um, so <laughs> so yeah. I haven't gotten good at answering the question, but what I just like to say is the easiest answer is I'm a social worker. The second level to that question is like, I'm just a good troublemaker. Right. So I think a lot of folks have learned about me through the Internet or Instagram, but people who have known me prior to or have just been in my life before the Instagram stuff. No, I've been this way. This Kim is not new. This Kim is not different. This is the exact same person. So I'm a licensed clinical social worker. I'm located in Richmond, Virginia. I have a full-time job where I do so I do community-based work at a local nonprofit. But on the side, I just get into extra trouble. I get into trouble, trouble at work, work. That pays my insurance. <laughs> I also get into trouble on my own. Mm -hmm. I love that introduction. I'm a troublemaker. Yeah, I love it. Right. Like, why are we living if we're not getting in trouble? Especially good trouble. What are we doing? Right. Well, tell us a little bit more about the trouble you're getting into. So it depends on the day of the week. But my primary course to getting in trouble is to really lean into the liberation for Black folks, in particular, Black youth. Like, they have been the center of my work for over a decade, and it's the ones who are identified as deep systems or multi-system involved youth. A lot of them have, you know, contact with the juvenile legal system. So getting into trouble for them, not speaking for them because they got a lot to say and they can say things on their own, but making more spaces and pathways to opportunities so they can get some power and make some more decisions of what happens to them, their families and communities. That is really badass. Before we dig more into the work, I'd love to rewind and hear a little bit more about your coming into social work story. Like what was youth like and, and why did you decide to become a social worker? Yeah, I didn't decide. I did not decide to become a social worker. I did not know what social work was when I was in undergrad. So I'm a first generation college student. So when I got to undergrad and graduated, I was done. Like I had made it because that's the story they tell millennials. Like they pushed all mm -hmm. of us into school and now we got hella debt and we're just trying to figure out life, right? I got like four or five jobs. But my undergraduate degree was in behavioral science and sociology. I don't know what I was going to do with that. But I knew I just liked human behavior and enjoyed it. But I graduated 
and I moved back home like a lot of people after they graduated from college. I started working and in my first job, I did residential treatment. At that time, they were identified as severely emotionally disturbed adolescents. And so I was working in residential treatment, doing that work. And then I started seeing how people were moving on my unit. I noticed like there was this group of people who would come in and pull the kids out of either class or the rooms or recreation and like take them away and, and do something. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, what are they doing with them kids? <laughs> so, like, <laughs> kids back. <laughs> what are they doing with them kids over there? So then like I just started asking more questions and they were just telling me, oh yeah, like I'm a social worker. I'm working towards license to be a therapist, all this other kind of stuff. I was like, social work? Okay. Uh, so I started researching programs. And applied to a couple MSW programs and got accepted to the Virginia Commonwealth University out here in Richmond, Virginia, and moved across the country and started wow. to embark on this journey of social work because I didn't know what it was. So I mm-hmm. found me and fell into it. I kind of have a similar story. Like I knew I wanted to be a therapist and I was seeing someone at the time who was a social worker, a therapist, and and she was like, yeah, it's only a two-year degree and you don't even have to take the GRE. And I was like, Bye. <laughs> That's why I did it. Right? Right? Listen, everybody else was like, oh, I got to study for the GRE. Well, guess what? I don't do well. Standardized right. tests. Mm-hmm. How I pass the licensure exam, ain't nothing but the universe was covering me. But like, <laughs> yeah, no GRE. I said, bad, I'm mm-hmm. going. Right. Yeah. And I, I also feel like, you know, once I got in, I was like, oh, yeah, this shit is my jam. Mm-hmm. It started to make sense, even though it was also concerning being in the program because there was a handful of just black people that were in my program. And I was like, what is this? And then even like in my social justice class, just hearing some of the people talk about the work, about the various populations. I was like, "Uh oh, so I even had apprehensions. Like once I got into the program, I did not have a good first semester for a lot of different reasons in social work school. But once I made it through then it started to make a bit more sense. It still didn't fully fit on me as an identity till maybe like three years ago. Hmm. Did anything shift three years ago that made that change? I liberated myself from the idea that I had to be a therapist. Hmm. Yeah. Right? Because a lot of people, they kind of go down this route of social work as a method of becoming a therapist. And so they push us into a micro track, right? You got to choose either you're going to be hmm. macro or micro. So you're going to take a clinical or a policy track in your graduate program. And of course, everybody primarily took the clinical route. So if me not having a foundation of social work, that's how I understood it. Right. Until I started to see there were so many different ways to move in this field. And I did not have to identify as a therapist to be a social worker. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, we can certainly talk about the problematic things that happen in academia that prevent a lot of black and brown students from getting in. It's a, I'm a professor at one university and was working at two for a while. And being a professor, I have the job of passing or failing someone, right? Mm-hmm. But by the time somebody gets in my class, I have to hold them to the standards of the university, right? But why did this kid not get help before they got into my class, right? Like, it's so problematic because I'm thinking about it from acceptance, right? Accepting people in, preparing people for what they're yeah. going in for and making learning more accessible, like shifting the way that the program works. I know it at Loyola University where I'm teaching, they actually created, I don't even know what they call it, but it's essentially like you can get the same undergrad and graduate degrees, but it's like a more like handholding and like nurturing. Mm. And they really like walk students through it, which feels really good for folks coming from not having the same education opportunities. But most places like you're just throwing kids in that are unprepared, right? completely unprepared. And my MSW program at the time, I don't know if this is still the case, but within the two years of being in the program, or if you're in the four-year part-time program, if you get three C's, you're kicked out. Yeah, that's. I think that's a national. Right. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, that is some foolishness. (laughs) And so my first semester, we lost so many people, in particular, like Black and Brown folks who just got kicked out of the program the first semester because of that three C stuff. That was some foolishness. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you made it through and you're out and now you're doing what the fuck you want to do. <laughs> what I want to do. 
until yeah. I can. <laughs> yeah. Well, what do you have a vision of? I mean, obviously liberation, but like, is there a specific kind of focus that you're giving this work that you're doing? Like, do you envision what you want for yourself and the kids that you're working for? Yeah, like I would just want to do the best with what I got and what I know, right? So I can accept that throughout the course of my life and even probably my generation's time and the generation under me, not much is going to change, right? There's still going to be anti-Blackness, systemic and institutional racism, white supremacy will prevail. Not much will change. So what I refuse to do is allow myself to be and become exhausted by this idea that I can be a part of eradicating that during my lifetime. So <laughs> can we just pause there for a second? Because that's yes. huge. And I got to admit, as you were talking, I was like, that can't be true. That can't be true. <laughs> but honestly, that's probably like just my like naive white hope of not mm. living the experience. Right. But I mean, if it's lasted this long, why would I possibly think in my lifetime it's going to go? Yeah. yeah, it's not going anywhere. Mm. And a part of, you know, um, what is it? Critical race theory is to accept that racism is permanent in this country, in the United States, it is permanent. And so being able to accept that then allows me to dream, Mm. right? I can't, I can't really fully dream if I can't acknowledge that, like, it ain't going going Mm. much, but there's still a lot of good that I can do with the time I have and what I have access to and what I know. So that's my vision is just to do what I can with what I know and what I have but not live in this idealistic bubble that in my lifetime, that a lot of things are going to change. But mm. doesn't mean we don't try and we still can't do good because we can't. Right. It's been happening for generations. Right. Well, and I guess the one thing, and this isn't necessarily just related to racism, but related to overall understanding of like mental wellness, even my generation, so I'm I'm Gen X, which is just one generation above millennial, right? Like my parents didn't go to therapy and didn't think therapy was important, right? And now mm-hmm. Gen Xers are into it and millennials are so into it. <laughs> and the Generation Z is making TikToks about it. So, you know, we're right. all working together. <laughs> right, right. And so I guess that's my hope, right? And then obviously a layer on top of that, we have to make sure that we are doing our best to liberate social work and and therapy and psychology and all of those institutions where white supremacy has been embedded the whole time. Yeah. If we don't, then all of this kind of baton passing that's been happening across generations is going to be a waste of everybody's time. Right. If we don't figure out how we do it, or you're just going to end up with people just creating more factions and who needs more groups, who Mm -hmm. needs more separation. So, yeah, we got to figure it out. Yeah. This question just popped up as we're talking about, like, how heavy this work is. How do you take care of yourself? I definitely know how to separate the work, but at the same time, I can't deny that it's a part of me. Right. Like I've, I've been doing this kind of existing this way since I was in the sixth grade. Like that's my earliest recollection of like being this version, a version of myself. Mm. So I don't really know what it's like to not exist this way, but I do know how to be like, no, or I'm not working or take the email off the phone or like sit at home and drink some wine and watch Lifetime channel movies. Like I know how to, (laughs) I know I did not thank you for a lifetime person. (laughs) Listen, I just watched Psycho Stripper yesterday. What? Psycho Stripper? Tell me about that. Psycho Stripper. So, yeah, like I definitely, I definitely know how to pause and take the breaks and rest because I just understand that rest doesn't have to be earned now. I was one of those people who was like, oh, you got to earn it. Like I got to, if I get X, Y, and Z done, then I can. Well, I, I don't operate that way anymore. Yeah. So I just take my rest when I want it for as long as I need it. Yeah, that piece, connecting that with white supremacy is one of the Mm. things that clicked so much for me because I'm an overachiever. I love work because, right, like we're in a field where we're making change. And so I want to keep doing it and Mm -hmm. I have ideas and I want to create businesses. (laughs) Um, But but recognizing that that the underlying foundation of that was white supremacy, I was like, Mm -hmm. oh this is not cute. This is why I'm burning myself to the ground. Mm -hmm. A word. Yes. (laughs) Yes. 
Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. Well, the show is called Conversations with a Wounded Healer. And so I, I ask every guest two questions. One being, do you consider yourself a healer? Yeah, no. I think that being called or identifying as a healer removes the power and the onus of the individual who you come in contact with. Because there, people are their own healers. People are their own redeemers. People are everything that they need. And so one thing that I never want to contribute to is to believe that like somebody can not achieve healing without me because you can. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like it is possible. Yeah. Like some people are trained in the work. Some people are drawn to the work. Some people are called to the work who can help guide someone along their healing journey and their path. But that doesn't mean that that person's healing when they achieve it was because the healer was in relationship with them. So, yeah, no, I don't consider myself to be a healer. I really just consider myself to be a people that sits with people Mm. in the depths of their pain, however they allow me to do it. Yeah. Yeah. That's like, yeah, that's a big identity. I don't know if I want that much responsibility. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And yeah, when I asked this question, there's two sides of the coin. There's what you shared and like, I don't want that responsibility. (laughs) It's on you to heal yourself that. And then there are those of us on the other side who are like, everyone's a healer. Right. And, and it's tapping into your own power. Right. So it's, it's, it's so interesting to hear people's answers to that. Mm, No, like everybody is a healer because we need each other. Right. Like we're interconnected. We, we should Mm -hmm. we don't operate that way in America because of white supremacy and whatnot. But, humans are interconnected and we need each other. So if we're all operating as healers, then I I don't look at you just to be that. I'm one too. You're one too. We're all one. Well, and I think about clients who come to me, I do work in private practice as a therapist and clients who come to me and essentially it's almost like dumping the stuff and being like, okay, you fix me. And I don't want that. And that's not how it works. Like, there's so much desperation right now. I mean, that's just what I'm seeing everywhere. And, and a lot of times it leads our clients to really objectify us and think that we have some sort of like magical, mystical power. I mean, they teach us about the magic wand in school, right? Like (laughs) if you take the magic wand, (laughs) (laughs) but I mean, there's also exploitation that's happening on behalf of providers, on behalf of therapists who are exploiting clients. And not just people in private practice, but just even systems involved therapists who are part of treatment that are exploiting clients because there is this level of like, oh, desperation is just what I'll I'll call it right now because people are, they're dying, literally, figuratively, spiritually, you know what I mean? And so they're just trying to find a way to stay afloat, not necessarily even thrive right now, but just stay afloat. And so when they're coming for somebody, coming to a therapist for whatever that help is, they really are looking to us to fix it all. And there are some therapists who will position themselves on a pedestal like they can and they will fix Mm -hmm. it all. It didn't take them people money and not make them any better. (laughs) Right, right, (laughs) right. Or empower them at all. You know what I mean? So it's like both sides of it is sticky and it doesn't really feel good all the time to sit in therapist communities when you just know there are a handful of therapists who are exploiting people. It's every profession, right? There's, Mm -hmm. and I don't want to say that to excuse the therapists who are doing it because I think that in our field, it's extra bad, right? Like there's fields where I think it's the power differential, right? So therapists have power over people, police have power over people, right? People in those types of professions, if you are not really checking your own ego and your own level of responsibility or pathology, geez. (laughs) You make somebody worse. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you will just ruin a person. Right. Yeah. It's really scary. So <laughs> if you're a client and you're listening and you talk to a therapist and they say that they can fix all your problems, leave, run. Leave immediately. <laughs> Matter of fact, <laughs> ask for your intake money back. Yeah, right. <laughs> like, leave. Yeah. And it's interesting that obviously being licensed professionals, we have governing boards that are supposed to do something about these people. But oftentimes, what I see sometimes is these people are not doing something that would threaten their license necessarily, but we know that they're actually causing harm. And so there's nothing to be done. Mm -hmm. It's the sticky part of like just the ethics, right? There are some parts of the ethics that will fall in line with regulatory boards. But then there's other parts of the ethics that are just open. 
Right. And my concern is those parts that are open are the ones that are causing the greatest harm. Right. Hey, therapists, do I have something exciting for you? Head Heart Conversations is a webinar series for psychotherapists designed to invite your inner healer to the forefront of your personal and professional life. At my practice, Head Heart Therapy, we approach healing from the inside out. We believe that in order to offer the best care to our clients, we therapists must do our inner healing work as well. At this point in history, we are called to move beyond the old ways of being and courageously step into a new paradigm. Therapists are poised to support our clients' transformation, but we must also transform ourselves. In this four-part series, we will invite participants to learn about themselves as well as enhance their clinical skills. The first webinar takes place on March 5th, and it's called dun, 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 Conversations with a Wounded Healer, and it's a call to action intended to challenge participants to step into their own healing with courage. As a special thank you to Conversations with a Wounded Healer listeners, you can get $20 off your order by using the code PODCAST when you register. For more information and to register, please visit www.tinyurl.com slash hhconvos. And don't forget to use the code PODCAST. This kind of begs the question, how do you feel about call-out culture? What's your relationship with that sort of way of holding people accountable? Help me understand how you understand call-out culture. You mean like blasting people on the internet and stuff? Yeah. I mean... I see why people do it because they receive gratification and confirmation that it works. Whatever works is, it works. Now, does it cause a harm? Yeah, like I wouldn't do it. Call out culture is not how I get down because my creed is do no harm emotionally, physically, just do no harm. That's the intent. That's what call out culture is all about. But I, I would really question who's it really about when people do it? Yeah. Like, yeah, whose ego is being served when we're calling someone out. Right, right. Yeah. In my anti-racism journey, one of my like mentors in that said, call in, not call out. Yeah. I mean, we got to call each other in because there's still opportunity to repair whatever harm is done. When you call out, all you do is just make the harm worse. When you call somebody in, you could try to, I would hope there's a willingness on both ends to try to, you know, repair and restore. Right, right. And as we're saying this too, I'm thinking about people who were involved in the insurrection on Capitol Hill. And that's different, right? Like, <laughs> that's di- right? Like, I'm, I, it, yeah, I'm always like, when new things come up, I'm trying to figure out where they fit and how I understand the world. And then it's just unexcusable, right? There are some things where we should be calling people out because it's like, there is no hope. <laughs> yeah, you'd be like, y'all, come on now. Like, <laughs> So yeah, there's no way. <laughs> yeah, nah. <Mm-mm. laughs> Blast them. Put the homie with the horns on his head. Keep putting them all on the internet, all on the TV. No, there's mm-hmm. no calling that in. <laughs> yeah, right. I saw a post yesterday on Instagram where somebody was saying, you know, like white people don't distance yourself from the Trump supporters and whatever, because we have to be able to have these conversations And yet when I'm having some of these conversations and I I talked to a client about this this week, there's a wall that you hit Mm. at some point, sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. Some people just cannot hear it. And then it's like, what, like literally what the fuck? There's nothing else we can do. And that's when I bump up against hopelessness. That's Mm -hmm. when I start thinking like, well, if I can't get someone to at least like open their mind just a little bit to like see what's really happening, then I just feel helpless. Yeah. People are only going to see what they want to see. You know, I ain't got no control. No one has any control. Like even, you know, working with young people, clients in general, when you really have that conversation and have them separate what's in your control and out of your control. Mm-hmm. And when people really take a look and like, oh, I really don't have that much control over anything but myself. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that in and of itself <laughs> is empowering. Mm hmm. So to know that the thing you have control over is yourself and the person you spend the the most time with on the planet is you, who do you think you need to be focused on right now? (laughs) (laughs) Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But yeah, that hopelessness piece is real. The struggles with our relationship with control and power, those are real. Because I think a part of hopelessness comes with how are we in relationship with control and power. Right. 
Yeah. Well, do you want to talk a little bit about your relationship with control and power? I'd love to hear that. Yeah, I've definitely reevaluated lately. And even in my full-time job, I'm in a administration level position at my organization. And so even with my team or my staff, they'll be like thinking, oh, I thought we had to make a proposal or I thought I had to look. I don't know what makes y'all think I want this much control. I don't <laughs> want this much control over my life. Mm -hmm. If you share this is something that you want to do, you believe it's going to benefit the people, the work, the organization, what do you need for me to make it happen? Right. And so my relationship with power and control has evolved. One thing I am not afraid to say anymore is that I'm on a mission to get more power so I can redistribute it. Right. Like I think the way we got to do it to position people in particular, Black folks, is we got to acquire more power to give more power, not acquire power and like get bigger and bigger and bigger as an individual, but acquire it and pass it out to the people. And so I really push back even with folks who have power, definitely white people, definitely people in decision-making positions, what part of your power are you willing to give up? Because you're talking about you want to see all this change happen in community across the country where you got to give some of your power up. Yeah, well, I love that you're in a leadership position and I already hear you redistributing the power, right? Because the manager who likes to micromanage and control every little piece of it, that's restrictive. That's restricting people from, you know, bringing in their good ideas and feeling like this is a place where we can brainstorm and have something creative. And I was just doing a presentation yesterday about trauma and talking about burnout in organizations. Mm -hmm. And as a social worker, and on the bottom level, there's very little you can do to exert any power. But the people in leadership, just like you, those are the ones who can make the changes. And those are the people who have to be aware of what causes burnout, what gets people in these situations. And frankly, literally like waking up causes trauma right now in the Hello. pandemic. So yeah. what are we doing at the organizational level to create more space for people in this moment? Is your organization able to do anything to like give more time off? Or I, I don't even know what the answer yeah. is. Yeah, I think, you know, and I even challenge that when I'm brought in to consult with organizations and agencies, when they try to tell me that their employees are experiencing burnout, I'm like, y'all. Now, y'all got organizational trauma running up in this thing mm -hmm. <laughs> that is contributing to some stuff. Mm -hmm. But even within my own organization, we have a lot of freedom to really design like how we prioritize rest. And that's one thing in leadership that I push with my executive director is like, how are we showing here that we prioritize rest? How are we showing that we take care of our people first? If we can't get those things straight, then it doesn't really matter the programs and services and the money we raise and the things that we do if we're not taking care of the people who are taking care of the people. Like we gotta take care of our people first. Yeah. As you're saying that, I'm I'm thinking about the way that you brand yourself as a troublemaker and what you're talking about is not troublemaking. Mm. And yet <laughs> to make make trouble. Trouble. I'm getting in trouble, Sarah. Um, and I'll be saying these things to people. <laughs> well, and that's fucking bullshit. Right. <laughs> <laughs> like everything I hear you saying, I'm like, I'm so glad you're having yeah. these conversations, right? Mm -hmm. Like my first job in community mental health, luckily, I also had a, a supervisor who was stressing rest. And if I had a suicidal client, and I was like waiting to get them hospitalized, then I could take some comp time the next day. And, and yeah. that's not normal in most organizations, nope. I found out. So it makes me angry that you are experienced as a troublemaker. Yeah, there's levels to troublemaking. And I certainly pick and choose. <laughs> I certainly pick and choose the battles, but there are some parts that I will not be quiet about. I won't stop talking about. And that is one of them because I know what it's like. Like I've been on the other end of just bad supervision. I've been on the other end of being in an organization that did not give a shit about its employees. They cared about billable hours, productivity, notes, 
Well, and let's extend that to the states, right? Because working in an organization, most of the community mental health, all the money comes from grants, right? Yeah. And the grants come from the state. And yep. so the metrics come from the state. Yes, they so do. So let's fucking talk to somebody at the state level to be like, can we be more honest about what is actually doable? Mm -hmm. Because like we have clients whose problems cannot be solved, right? Like you said, racism is never going away. Severe mental illness is never going away. Addiction is never going away. Poverty is never going away, right? All of these things that we're not going to be able to fix for people. So the people who are writing these motherfucking grants and telling us that we have to provide so many billable hours and evidence-based like success fuck that that is not yes. how this works and that's the job that i quit i was in community mental health for five years and i quit that job without having a job i said i can't do this shit no more mm -mm. Mm -mm. i can't keep writing y'all quarterlies monthlies individual notes family notes group notes assessments mm -hmm. and ain't nothing changing right and y'all are sending me kids that don't even need to be here community mental health is it's a beast. It is a well-funded beast. I don't care if people say they money be coming into community mental health. I believe it's the way it's allocated. Well, in Illinois, sadly, our state is stupid. So <laughs> they're not. Community mental health is not well-funded here. I But I hear mm. on the East Coast, it's like so much better. And I don't know why. I feel like, well, when I talk about community mental health, I know a lot of the localities also treat substance use disorders. And so a lot of money came in for that. The other part, like the SMI stuff, not so much. Youth services, not so much. But community mental health here in Virginia is also incredibly predatory, especially for the youth services where kids have to have Medicaid to qualify for things like intensive in-home or for therapeutic day treatment services in school, even for like ABA stuff. And so it, it was just preying on poor folk at the end of the day, to get them enrolled in these programs and services that a lot of the times they didn't even need. And every kid was coming in diagnosed with ADHD, ODD, CD. And I would be like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. what? This baby ain't got that trauma. Yeah. Community violence. Yeah. Domestic violence in the home. Yeah. A lot of things were environmental outside of this baby's control, but yet they labeled as the problem. They're the one with the diagnosis. They're the ones with the treatment and services that they did not even ask for. Right. I have a big issue with like treating kids through the state because where was the consent? Right. Where, where were they like, sign me up for it. I want to go to treatment. Find me a kid. Right. Well, but, and it's, yeah. it's because they come in contact with schools, right? Schools, the court, DSS. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's those systems where we're asking people to act in a certain way as if they weren't traumatized, where there's, like you said, tra the trauma is rampant and it's all different levels of trauma. Yeah, I mean, but for social workers and folks in the counseling profession, community mental health is a huge workforce for us. Like, we can get a job. Like, if something goes bad in my life right now, I can go find me a job at the local community service mm -hmm. and be fine. But I think that's also a problem. We just continue to create more job opportunities in that system instead of all these other ones that support communities in their community in a different way. Like, why aren't we really thinking about where these jobs are popping up for us. Do you ever see yourself creating your own organization that's going to answer some of these needs? I don't know about an organization, there, but I've been manifesting. I want me a car wash. <laughs> I, <laughs> yeah, want tell me more. <laughs> I want me a car wash because it can serve for a lot of different purposes. One, I just want to be able to create pathways, just improve economic opportunities for young people. I just want to create jobs for black and brown folks. I worked with court involved youth for a number of years and young adults and employment is a huge barrier to them dreaming about what their lives can be. And I just noticed out here where I live, there are just a lot of young black people and older black folks who have like these mobile detailing companies and parking lots. And I'm like, hmm, they like washing cars, don't they? Yeah, I want me a car wash. I just want to get a car wash employ some folks, even maybe have a little social component. If you want to get some help with whatever it is, goal you have in life, go to this office and see this person. But if you just want to work at this car wash to get your life together, you can work here. But yeah, I want me a car wash. I don't want no agency, no nonprofit. I don't want none of that. That's <laughs> absolutely brilliant. That is a genius <laughs> idea. Nobody yeah. steal it. TM, TM, TM for Kim Young. <laughs> Trademark for Kim Young. Or you can invest in it. Hit me up. Look. Right? Yeah. Wow. There's an organization here 
the coffee shop is called Sip of Hope. And it's Mm. the organization is a suicide prevention nonprofit. And then they have the physical space for the coffee shop. And they have, I think it's just like peer to peer. I love that. Right. Yeah. But it's, you know, a similar model to what you said, like they create jobs and they have space if you want to talk. I would love to talk because for anybody that's listening, y'all, we don't need no more nonprofits. Like 501c3s and nonprofits are not going to save us. They will not fund the revolution. (laughs) However you understand the revolution, Mm -hmm. they will not save us. So please, like for me, I was down that road. Oh, yeah, I'm going to get me a nonprofit. But then I I learned, I listened, Mm -hmm. I consulted with people that I trust and was like, "Mm, you're right. They're not. And so, yeah, I don't want an agency or organization. I want a business that's built with people in mind. Brilliant. I can't wait to see your car wash. (laughs) What are you going to call it? I don't know. I want the babies to name it. I love doing focus groups and like talking with young people because even other initiatives I worked on out here, like their brains are amazing. So like, I want them to name it. So brilliant. Mm -hmm. I love it. (laughs) (laughs) You said an agency organization knows they're a car wash. We want it. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> oh man well let me know if you need a jingle singer for the commercial, the commercial. i'm in it i'm down <laughs> i love me a good jingle I truly me do. too that was that was my like first dream job was being a jingle singer i love that yeah i love that <laughs> Well, the other question that i always ask folks is do you consider yourself a wounded healer how do you like that term I like that term. I think that term leans into the honesty of being a human. Everybody's wounded. I don't care if people say, if you were born on this planet, you were born into some pain. And I know just being Black, and that's all I know, as I was born Black, as I was born into trauma and born into pain, but also born into joy. Mm. So the wounded healer piece, I can certainly hear that easier, right? Like it can sit on my spirit a bit better than the healer part. Because like I just previously mentioned, wounded just acknowledges my humanity. And I think as social workers and as therapists, oftentimes we're not seen as humans with feelings, with joys, traumas, pains, families, responsibilities, all Mm -hmm. these things, right? But yeah, the wounded piece speaks to the humanity. And so, yeah, Mm -hmm. wounded healer, indie, not perfect. Been through some shit, still dealing with shit, still causing shit. You know what I mean? <laughs> so like, <laughs> I don't got it all figured out. Mm. Well, I don't know about you, but I feel like being in this profession, almost kind of like, I think if you're doing it right, and I'm going to be judgmental here, but I think if you're doing it right, it really sets you up to begin to heal these wounds, to really take an honest look at how you're moving through the world and how that affects other people that you're supposedly helping, right? Mm -hmm. If anybody who started out doing this work, if you're the same person after interfacing whatever client population that you've been with, you're not supposed to be here. You're not supposed to be doing this work. When I tell you after 10 plus years of working with teenagers, if they didn't teach me about myself, if they did not hold the mirror in front of my face and be like, look, you full of shit. Because if anybody going to tell you the truth about you, it's going to be a kid. So I have learned so much about my own pains, my own judgments, my own traumas, like my own inauthenticity at times. Oh, really? Yeah, like because the kids will sniff you out. Because words don't mean anything to them. Behaviors, everything. And so I had a kid tell me one time, you fake. (gasps) I know, right? I'm looking at you like, no. (laughs) Excuse me, what? Um, But then like... (laughs) How dare you? After we kind of, you know, we processed it. Was I hurt? Hell yeah. Fake. What me? But then after he kind of gave me what his observation was, I was like, oh, I could dig that. Because he was mm. like, you be using them words. And I'm, don't nobody really be knowing what them words mean, Miss Young. I was mm. like, you're right. Like, there's a different way that I could show up. Mm. Like, were you using clinical language? Yeah, I was using words. And they was like, we don't know them words. Mm. And so I think even when he said, like, you're fake, you're using words we don't know. Or, you know, you're not talking to us like regular. I was like, you're right. Mm. You're right. And so even from that interaction, I changed how I approach the work. Because remember, like, 
You get a conditioning when you're going through supervision. You get a conditioning when you're in your programs about how you're supposed to show up with clients, what you're supposed to do, not supposed to do, boundaries and walls that you keep up. But right. then when you start doing the work, you're like, wait a minute, like I'm sitting with another human. I'm one of those two, which means that my human stuff is going to show up in these interactions with clients. And I cannot shame myself for that. So yeah, like you learn so much about your own self and your own healing journey through this work. And that's okay. I don't like when they try to judge us and shame us that it was only be there for clients. It's not for you. Who told you that lie? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. That's something I've really been specifically unwinding 2020 as we, you know, have gone through the pandemic and and we're experiencing the same thing our clients are. And this is the first time this has ever happened on this like massive scale. And so I can't not be a human in the room with you. I There are things that previously I probably would have tolerated and not asked for from my clients because, oh, yes, the space is only for them. But now I need you to know that I'm human. I need you to know that I have struggles, too. And we're not going to talk about my struggles, but I just need you to know I have them. I have them. <laughs> Even if it's like in the moment, I would even share when I was having a hard time staying focused. Mm -hmm. Right. But going through supervision, that's not something I receive. But during practice and mm -hmm. just noticing, well, I'm a human, you're a human. I got to tell you what's going on. Number one, I don't want to waste your time and your money. So mm -hmm. let me tell you what's going on, mm -hmm. <laughs> like what I'm experiencing. The human relationship is key in the work. It's center to the work. And you just learn more about yourself through other people. And I value that. Absolutely. Well, do you want to tell folks where it is that they can find you and support your work? Certainly. So I am on the internet, in particular Instagram, getting into a little bit of good trouble. My favorite thing. Yeah, you are. <laughs> and you can, folks can follow me there at dope black underscore social worker. I'm on the Bird app that's also known as Twitter, but I don't really know how to use it like that. So I don't either. You know what I mean? So I'm not even going to tell y'all about that. But if you happen to find me over there, maybe you'll get something from me. Maybe you won't. Also visit me on my website at dopeblacksocialworker.com. I have a couple of $12 webinars that are coming up, one on moral injury which is one of my favorites to provide because when I learned about moral injury, my life changed. Mm -hmm. And then another one on uh, social work one-on-one, -on -one, just unlearning social work. So, mm -hmm. yeah, unlearning social work? That's great. Unlearning great. social work. So the one on moral injury is on uh, February 4th and the one on social work one-on-one -on -one unlearning is on February 25th. Wonderful. So yeah, if folks want to follow along there and learn more, like I said, you can hit me up on Instagram or my mm -hmm. website. Great. Will you send us links for those webinars so we can advertise those for you? Because that sounds great. Yep. And, you know, we were able to raise a number of sponsorships to provide 200 promo codes to social black and brown social work students and early career social workers to attend the webinars at no cost. So the village is really showing up and showing out. That is so great. Well, before we wrap up, is there anything that we didn't talk about today that you want to make sure listeners hear from you? Well, not so much didn't talk about, but one thing, a message that I will continue to just share with folks is that we just got to remember to take care of our hearts and take care of each other. Because like at the end of the day, like we are all we have. And if we're not taking care of our hearts and if we're not taking care of each other, we're not going to make it far. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much, Kim. This has been such a pleasure. Yeah, thank you for having me. Thanks so much to Kim for joining us today. And if you liked what she had to say, definitely make sure you check her out on Instagram, check out her website, tune into those webinars that she's got upcoming. So she is kicking ass and taking names and I want to be a troublemaker right along with her. Thanks as always to Andrea Klunder and the Creative Imposter Studios for editing, to Liam O'Donnell for the album art and to Ben Mueller for our theme music. If you want to find more information about Kim where we've got all of these goodies, you can check the show notes and our website at www.headhearttherapy.com slash podcast. Until next time, bye-bye.